in Asia, our mission is to invest in leaders and in young leaders. Uh, so we have a, a Christian high school um, that is flourishing, and it's, it's in, incredible. It's a public high school, but it's Christian. And so it's, it's I guess it would be similar to, to maybe a, a charter kind of school here in Alberta, but we are able to share Jesus in that high school. We have a, a college in our, our building with which is growing, it teaches Christian values, Christian morals, and there are many who would come from across the, the border to that school. We've, we will hit 600 students at that college this fall. Um, and we have a church in our building, and we work with the churches within our city, and it's, it's, it's special. At a recent ministry event, I was introduced as the, uh, the pastor who meets with depressed pastors and encourages them, and that was actually felt like a good, a good word. When in Asia, and we've got a picture of this too, we are on the MTR, the subway, all of the time. And we don't drive a, a great deal because the subway is incredibly efficient. And my wife starts to complain if we have to wait more than three minutes for a train. All of a sudden, I'll look beside me or hear beside me this muttering. Like, she, like if it's more than three minutes to wait uh, for, for a train. But... It, it's just a, it's a crazy place to be. The third thing that we do is marriage ministry, both in Asia and in Canada and other nations. And our materials are being used in all kinds of weird places. Um, it's, it's just crazy. Our, the city that we are in is in the top five for divorce in the world. And so we didn't have that on our job description other than a single line when we arrived, and it's turned into this thing that we do fairly regularly. And uh, Leanne and I are quite vulnerable when we share, and, and our culture is not used to that vulnerability. Uh, so they are hungry for it as we share. Uh, the, the last time we spoke, we unpacked a disagreement that we had had that week and how, what had happened and how we resolved it. And the jaws were on the floor because they'd never heard a pastor be vulnerable in that way. Uh, but they booked us again, so I guess that was okay. <laughs> We've got a, a picture of a couple of Chinese symbols that, that say, Wei Ji, that's the, the symbols that, that the, or that's what they, I think they say. In my, in my, limited, my limited Mandarin. But what it, it means, it, this is the word for crisis. And it's made up of the symbol for danger and the symbol for opportunity. Our region is changing rapidly. It's changing fast. And so as every time we go, we're asking kind of our trusted friends, are we okay? Is it safe? How do we proceed? How do we live? And... In the middle of that kind of danger are all these crazy new opportunities where people from places where the gospel cannot be shared are coming into our city with a new freedom and we are able to share the gospel really openly in our city still. And so it, it's, it's really fascinating. I wish I could take you there for even a couple of days to get a sense of that. So many... Many are coming to know Christ for the first time. And one of my favorite questions that I got asked as we met with a group of students, a couple of them came in really close and said, so, you've met the ghost. And I'm like, the ghost? Like, what do you mean? The, the ghost. You've met the ghost. And I'm like, well, I've met God. I have a Yes, that's what we mean. That's what we mean. And so unpacking my relationship with God with students who had no idea what that was all about. And just beautiful to, then to see some of those students accept Christ in the past year. The last thing that we do is we invest in leaders globally. I, I am on Zoom at all kinds of hours and in coffee shops at all kinds of hours with the people who Holy Spirit brings our way. So big things, a little overwhelming, but God is, is helping us. Today we're going to look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse, verse 4 and kind of read, read my way through. It's a long passage, but pay attention. There's good stuff. So Jesus had to pass through Samaria, and he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus 
wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, about one o'clock in the afternoon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink? For me, a woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, I love this, this little part. He said, go call your husband, your husband and come here. The woman answered him and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the man, one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you were a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Pay attention. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but nobody said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. We often talk about evangelism and missions in church. And we're encouraged to reach out in our communities. I know that that's a theme here at Gateway. And you as Gateway invited me to speak today. And so you, we, we know that you're passionate about missions. Um, and it's important, but it can seem so big and scary and impossible making us feel overwhelmed by the task with the temptation to leave it all over there to Pastor Len and Pastor Josh, like to let them do that thing, that mission thing. But the beautiful thing about our text today is that Jesus gives us an example of what it can look like to meet people with the life-changing message of the gospel. And so we're going to look at five things quickly that Jesus does in this passage that are great clues for you. The first thing, Jesus was out in the community doing ordinary, everyday kind of things. He was was at the Tim Hortons or the Starbucks, depending on where you land coffee-wise, of the community. He was at the water well. He was traveling. He got tired and thirsty. And he's having this normal experience. So picture your Tuesday morning. Where are you on Tuesday mornings? Is it work? Is it school? Is it a coffee shop? Where are you and what are, what are you doing? And in your Tuesday morning, in that location that you are at, where is the opportunity? What opportunity do you have to share the good news of Jesus? You see, sharing the good news for Jesus wasn't a job or a task. It was his life. It was part of him. I, uh, as Landon said, we're in Asia. And and in Asia, there isn't a whole lot of hockey. And Leanne gives me two minutes, or so she says. I get to talk about hockey with her for two minutes. And then after that, I'm out of people to talk hockey with. Like, it's it's hard. Like, I can read the headlines or or whatever. But there's, there's not a whole lot of hockey. And I managed to find 
a feng shui master on the internet who was a hockey fan. <laughs> and so we talked a couple of times and then we booked each other for coffee. And so I'm at this, this, co- this is just a few weeks ago, I'm at a coffee house in, in our city and I sit down with his feng shui master and we start to talk about hockey. And he's, he's brought his Wayne Gretzky cards to show me. Like, and so it's like he's in, right? He's in. And so we are looking at his, at his hockey cards. We're talking hockey. My heart is getting full. And then he says, I noticed that you're a, like you're a spiritual person. You're a, you're a pastor. And he said, could I ask your advice? And immediately it was like, okay, this is, a, this is about more than my passion for the NHL. This is, this is a God-given opportunity. And so he started to ask me advice. I started to share. And in just a few minutes, he's a puddle. Like he's starting to, to just tear up. And I said, like, could I, could I pray with you? And I wasn't super embarrassed or anything because as a guaylo, as a white guy over there, like I can do almost anything and people will just go, he's just a white guy, right? So I, so I lean across the table and I put my hand on his shoulder and just begin to pray for him. And he breaks, like just it's super special. And just we go deep with Jesus in this conversation. And I'm like, it wasn't in the church. It wasn't at like a Christian spot. It was just at the local tea house. Second thing that we can learn from Jesus is Jesus spoke to a woman who was not like him. And this is actually a large understatement. The woman who came to draw water was a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritans and the Jews, even though they were cousins, did not get along or like each other. In fact, they would break their normal customs of hospitality and push against the other, the other culture. So for Jesus, he's sitting here with a Samaritan woman and he doesn't give her the cold shoulder. He doesn't not engage with her. He engages with her. For you. Who would be the kind of person who you would naturally avoid? Would it be someone of a different political stripe? Would it be someone who doesn't look like you, who shares maybe a different culture, cultural background? Who would you not engage with? See, Jesus looks at us and he sees past all of those things. The second thing about her is she was a woman and spiritual leaders at that time may not have been comfortable with speaking with a woman alone in the community, but Jesus engaged with her even though she was of a different gender. Now she also came to draw water at the middle of the day. It was about one o'clock. And so you ask, well, why was she drawing water in the middle of the day when everybody else draws water at the beginning of the day? And you heard that expression where she's had five husbands and the man she's now with is not her husband and this is a small community and she would have a brutal reputation in her community. So she's not hanging around with all the other women at the regular time. She's come by herself because of her poor reputation. She was on the outside but Jesus sees her and engages her and suspends ju- judgment. We are far too quick to condemn. We are far too quick to judge the other, the outsider. But Jesus reached out in love to this woman. It was like he saw her, not as she was, but as he saw her as he created her to be. I'm going to say that again. Jesus saw her, not as she was, but rather as who he created her her to be and may we have his eyes when we see people John three seventeen. for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him Jesus was present to her in this moment one of the greatest gifts that we can give to the people around us is to almost like pause in our busyness pause in our tasks, pause in what we're doing, and just be present for the person in front of us. 
for me, I, like this is a weak spot for me. I've, I've got things to do, places to be, and, and, and so I, I run. And so God has kind of given me this little tactic of asking one more question. It's a little strategy, and it's, it's not for the people. Like it's for me to slow me down. But as I'm having, like as I'm ordering my coffee, I'll say good morning, but then I'll just try and ask one more question to the barista. So what does that tattoo mean that you've got? Or how's your day going? Like just one more thing. And in that moment to be open to what the Spirit of God is saying, to be slow, to be present with the people who are around us. See, I was once an outsider too. But I have been brought near to Jesus. And so I have something to offer those around me. The third thing that we can notice from Jesus is he operated in the, operated in the supernatural gifts in the community. Now, this is, a, this is a Pentecostal church. God's at work. Pastor Landon was demonstrating kind of words of knowledge or prophetic words for the, the little ones, which was just beautiful and, and special. Um, and we're used to that in those special or sacred moments. And often in Pentecostal churches, those moments happen after the fourth slow song. <laughs> so after, after Josh and Katie have done the fourth slow song, there's, look, there's, there's a holy hush. And then that's when God will speak, right? Like it's, that's the time. But for Jesus, he is at the Tim Hortons. He is at the Starbucks. There has been no prelude of beautiful worship leading to that moment. He's just there. And yet he's ready to hear from Holy Spirit and ready to engage with Holy Spirit and shares a prophetic word with the woman. He says, go call your husband and come back. And, and she says, I have no husband. And he says, you're right. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you're now with is not your husband. And bam, she's just like, oh my goodness, this guy is, he knows me without like it's a supernatural thing. He's just given a word of knowledge and it didn't happen in the church or the temple or the synagogue. Can we engage with Jesus when we're out and about? He's just as real out there as he is in here. Fourth thing that Jesus did is he offered her living water. Now, Christians are amazing at service. Like, it's, a, it's cool to go around the world and see the schools and the churches and the, the, the initiatives for the hungry all around the world. Like, the church has swung beyond its weight like, and made a, a huge impact. But in our service, we can forget that next step, and the next step is to offer living water, to offer salvation to those who would come. There is a spiritual poverty in people's lives as well as a lack of knowledge for school or, or the inability to get food. There is spiritual poverty. And Jesus says to the woman, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. Jesus brings living water. So for us, it's one thing for us to be kind, but then there's opportunity to share our, our faith. And you go, well, I, I, I don't know if I can. Like, like, how will I explain spiritual things? And, and listen to the next part, because the next part, the last thing that Jesus do, does is he gives a clue about the future, and he's talking to the woman in spiritual language. And it's all happening as a prelude to his world-shaking gift of his life on the cross, And so he starts talking to her. He says, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We support what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And so he's talking in spiritual language with this lady at the the water well. Now, I love him saying in spirit and in truth because he's saying in spirit means connected to the spiritual wherever we are. And in truth, all through the book of John, which is this, where this passage is from, all through the book of John, when it says truth, truth equals Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he's saying you're going to worship in spirit, 
So connected to the spiritual world, and you're going to worship in truth, which is through me. And so he's, he's talking deep spiritual stuff here. And it's interesting. She doesn't shy away or, or run away. He has a spiritual conversation, and she's present in it. And I'll say this, that as you engage with people in the community in spiritual conversations, there is something that you carry. You are filled with the love and the power of Jesus. You carry him. You carry his light. And so as you engage with people, they might not understand what you're saying, but there'll be a draw to the light that is within you through him. There's, there's a connection. And so people won't all run away. Some people will be scared, but some people will open their hearts to having deep conversations with you. It's fun. It's an ad a a adventure. And Jesus is, is bold. Now, the results of Jesus doing these things is really powerful. The, the woman leaves her water jar, runs into town, and says to the people, come see a man who told me all, everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And it's a crazy transformation for the woman because she's exposed, right? Like she's had her crappy life exposed, but somehow she feels safe with Jesus. Like he hasn't condemned her or judged her. He gives her hope. And a little later in, the, in, in that passage, he reveals to her that he's the Messiah and she is the first human being to know. Not a king, not a close friend, not the wealthy or Instagram influencer in the community, but a woman of poor reputation. And so as a result of this, her status in the community is actually being redeemed. She starts our story as a social outcast and she ends up as a leader in her community. She was impacted. And Jesus and his disciples end up staying longer and doing, doing work, transforming lives. So as a result of her obedience, her community is impacted. When we start to share Jesus in tune with Holy Spirit, we need to expect more than one person to be impacted. We actually need to expect that God is going to do great, great things. I got to be in Siberia in, uh, on a January winter, which is really a re not a great time to go. It's, it's, it's cold. Um, but we were there meeting with church planters. And so we would say to the church planters, so what's your pl church planting strategy? And I was prepared to write it all down. You know, like I, I wanted to see what they did. And they were kind of embarrassed and they didn't want to say like what their strategy was. And finally I got one guy to tell what his strategy was. And he said, what we do is, well, pastor, we, we go into a community and we pray. And then when God does something, then we start a church. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so can you show me? And so he, he takes Leanne and I to this little community and we go up into a, like an apartment building and we meet Lydia. And Lydia is there. She's the hostess. She's got 14 or 15 people in, in her little apartment. And we worship. We pray. Someone brought the word. And then we ate. And I, like, she brought all the food out. And so I'm sitting on the couch with Lydia. And there's a friend of hers beside her and another man on the couch. And so I said to Lydia, like, how did you come to be at this church? How did this happen? And she said, well... I had cancer, and they prayed for me, and I was healed, and I came to know Jesus. Okay, that's good. How did, how did you come? And the lady beside Lydia said, well, I heard from Lydia about how she was healed of cancer, and I came and I met Jesus, and that's why I'm here. So I looked down to the guy at the end, so how did you come here? And he's like, well, I heard from her about how Lydia was healed of cancer and I had some needs in my life and I came and God met me and I met Jesus and I'm here. And it's like this beautiful, organic multiplication that wasn't some big program or big thing. It was just God at work. 
So you, t- you here today, I've been praying for you. I was praying for you all, all through my flight back to Canada, and I felt to ask this. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you're not good enough. Like there's too much garbage from your past. Like you don't belong. But today, we want you to know that you are seen. Seen, and when God looks at you, he not only sees who you are, but who he created you to be. And there is hope in that. And he doesn't look at you with judgment. He looks at you with love and says, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. If that's you today, please talk to someone. Get prayed for. Connect in with Jesus. For the rest of us, for those who are here who are believers, been believers for a while, look up. Look up. The harvest is ripe. Later on in the chapter, it says, don't say four four more months and then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are ripe for harvest. It is time. It is time for us to step into the harvest fields and be activated into the adventure that God has for all of us because we are all called to be a part of the mission of God. It is not just a pastoral thing. It is not just a a deacon thing. It's, It's for all of us. You are his instruments. You are full of his life and his love and his power and it is time. The harvest is ripe. There are people on the other side of our obedience waiting to encounter Jesus. It's time. You're not just coming to church for a good music or a good word. You're coming to meet with the living God and to receive his power and his life in such a way that you can go out and meet the community right where you were at, full of Jesus, and bring them his hope. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever stop walking with Jesus. It's your call. It's not just a a missionary thing. It's not just a pastoral thing. It's your call. And it's the best adventure ever. Like it's so good. This morning I shared with with a guy who I've been connecting with for for about a year. I, I, I just started to share really openly about my walk with Christ and he didn't run away. Like it was just, it's so fun. It's so, like it's, it's risky, but it's so fun. Come and join them. Can I invite you to stand and let me pray o- over you? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence that's right here with us today. We thank you for your love that fills us. And, and Lord, today we pray for anyone in the room who feels like they are not good enough, who feel like they are not worthy of your love. And so, Lord, right now, I just ask that you would wrap your arms of love around them, that you'd step past the lies that they've believed about themselves, and that you would show them exactly who they are in you. That you would show them who you've created them to be. And God, I pray that we, as a church family, would be full of your power and your might, that we'd be full of your Holy Spirit. And God, help us to step past our inhibitions, step past our fear, and step into your adventure that you are inviting us into. And we ask these things in the mighty name of you, Jesus. Amen.